Good morning. I am Carol Browner, the Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us here today. And I particularly want to thank the many of you who are here who have been a part of the work that has gone into making today's announcement possible. Environmentalists, health experts, industry uh, representatives, to uh, each and every one of you a special thank you. Finally, I would also like to thank all of my colleagues at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, it has been a tremendous effort. We have done this in record time, and I appreciate everything you have given, the many hours, the many days, uh, the many nights, the many weekends, to making today possible. <laughs> Ten years ago, I had the opportunity to work for then-Senator Al Gore as he offered amendments to strengthen the Clean Air Act. For the past seven years, I have had the great honor to work in an administration and for a president who has fought consistently and successfully to take the tough provisions of the 1990 Clean Air Act and make them a reality for this country. Mr. President, your record on protecting public health and the environment is unparalleled. No president, no administration has done more to bring the American people clean air, safe water to drink, and communities free of toxic waste. You have proven time and time again that protecting our environment means protecting the health of our communities and the health of our families. The announcement that you make today is, is an important first that will have a lasting effect on public health and the environment for generations to come. Mr. President, you are the first president to ever set passenger vehicle pollution standards. Prior to today, only Congress has done that. Mr. President, because of your commitment and leadership to clear the air and protect public health, for decades to come, our children will breathe easier, and we thank you. Across this country, children's hospitals face an ever-growing number of asthma patients. In the last 15 years, children under five have experienced a 160% increase in asthma rates. At the forefront of the fight against asthma here in Washington is Children's National Medical Center. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the head of one of the nation's leading children's hospital, a wonderful place that has meant so much to my family during a difficult time and to families throughout the Washington area. Mr. Ned Zeckman, President and CEO of Children's National Medical Center. Thank you, Administrator Browner. Good morning. President Clinton, Administrator Browner, once again, our common goal of improving the lives of the nation's children bring us together. The children at our hospital were honored just last week with a visit from Mrs. Clinton, and as usual, she brought her special magic and socks to make this day a special one for our children. Whether it be a holiday visit to bring a smile to a child in the hospital or a major public policy announcement, we applaud this administration for your consistent leadership ensuring that America's children remain the highest among our nation's priorities. I am sure that if you had to guess, you might choose broken bones, trauma, or influenza as the number one reason that children are admitted to a children's hospital. But believe it or not, as Administrator Browner just said, asthma is the condition most treated by our physicians. In fact, this year alone, thousands of children will come through our emergency room complaining of shortness of breath and trouble breathing. 
the most recognizable symptoms of asthma. For a child, asthma can severely limit involvement in normal day-to-day -day activities such as organized sports and outdoor play, not to mention it can be extremely scary. At Children's, we've made major strides over the years to enhance the quality and efficiency of the services that we provide. The patients that suffer from asthma and are forced to visit the emergency room for treatment. While we're pleased with our efforts to bring new and innovative processes to the treatment of pediatric asthma, we also believe that efforts to improve the environment, particularly the quality of the air, will not only improve the quality of life for the child that suffers from asthma, but is also critical to reducing the number of children in the future that may develop symptoms of asthma or other respiratory diseases. On behalf of Children's National Medical Center and the providers of health care services for children across the nation, I look forward to today's announcement and the positive effects it will bring to improving the lives of our nation's most valuable resource, our children. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Gloria Hackman, who through her work here at Maury Elementary School knows firsthand the impact of a cleaner environment and what that can do for the health of our children. Ms. Hackman. Good afternoon, Mr. President, state, city, and government officials, honorable men and women, faculty, teachers, students, parents, and friends of Maury Elementary. My name is Gloria Hackman, RN. I am the school nurse at Maury Elementary School. I am employed by the DC Health and Public Benefit Corporation. This is my second year of school nursing and the year 2000 will be my 20th year as a registered nurse. I teach the open airways for school class, which is a school-based asthma health education program for children with asthma developed by the American Lung Association. Currently, I have 14 children enrolled in my class. We meet once a week for 40 minutes. Children who complete the Open Airways program should be able to define what asthma is, identify warning signs for an asthma episode, take steps to prevent an asthma episode, carry out appropriate preventive steps, and feel more confident about taking care of asthma on a daily basis. Asthma is the most common chronic illness among children as more than five million children in America suffer from the disease. It is the leading cause of school absenteeism. Parents make nearly one million emergency room visits every year, which accounts for half the $2 billion cost of treating children with the illness. When poorly managed, it can be life-threatening. Last year, about 200 children under the age of 15 died of asthma, double the number of a decade ago. Parents, in their attempt to keep their children in school, often depend on the school nurse to help their child control their illness. As a school nurse, my goal is to keep children in the classroom because a child that is having difficulty breathing cannot focus on school lessons. I see the difficulties children with asthma face, from having to remember to use their inhalers to reducing their outdoor activities on days with poor air quality. Through the Open Airways program, I help children get the accommodations they need to be healthy and able to learn in school. A lot can be done by nurses like myself to educate children and parents on how to live with asthma and reduce its chances of limiting the activities they enjoy. It also takes strong leadership in government to reduce the pollution that has often been linked to asthma. 
That is why it is an honor for me to, to introduce today a man who has used his high office to make cleaning the air and protecting children's health a priority. The President of the United States, my President, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the principal of this school, Dale Talbert, for welcoming all of us here and uh, all the members of the Maury School community. Thank you, and thank you for the nice sign there. And I want to thank the kids back here for being with me uh, and with you today. I want to thank uh, Gloria Hackman for the fine statement that she made and for 20 years of dedication as a nurse, uh, as a son and the grandson of a nurse. Uh, I liked hearing her speak. <laughs> and I also uh, want to say a special word of appreciation for the work being done here. I want to thank Ned Zeckman, the CEO of the Children's National Medical Center for the wonderful work he does every day, and in particular over the last seven years, the work that he and the First Lady have done together. And most of all, I want to thank Carol Browner, the EPA Assistant Administrator, Bob Perciseppi, and all the other people at EPA who work so hard to make this day come about. I, uh, <clears throat> if you knew how many times over the last seven years, in how many different contexts, Carol Browner had said to me, you have got to do something to reduce the incidence of asthma and other respiratory diseases among young children. We've got to keep doing it. It's the biggest problem out there most kids face. If you had any idea how many private encounters we had had on that that led to this happy day, you would be very grateful that someone like her is in public service in the United States, I'll tell you. <coughs> Thank you. Vice President Gore has given me a lot of good ideas, as he always reminds me when we're together. <laughs> But the recommendation to appoint her is surely one of the best. Let me, um, let me say a, another word about Gloria Hackman. She was here speaking not only for herself and out of her own experience, but in a way for all the children and families of this school and schools like it all across America. And uh, particularly on behalf of the children and families who struggle each day with the challenges of asthma. I want to commend everyone here who is working in the American Lung Association's Open Airways Program for all that you do to help our children breathe a little easier. As these children know only too well, a simple breath of fresh air is not something you can take for granted. You know, back at the beginning of our century, a little air pollution was considered a small price to pay for the bright economic future the Industrial Revolution was bringing us. In countless communities, in fact, black smoke billowing from the factory smokestack was a welcome symbol of newfound prosperity. Went on a long time. I remember when I first entered politics in Arkansas, there was a paper mill you could smell 80 miles away. And uh, people didn't like it 80 miles away, but where it was really strong in the community, uh, they'd say it was the smell of money. And that's what people believed. But after a while, the air became so fouled in places like Pittsburgh that the street lights had to be kept on during the day so people could see. Businessmen traveling to New York knew to bring along a second white shirt, even if they were staying just a day because by the afternoon, the first one would be coated with soot. Americans soon came to realize 
that dirty air was not just a nuisance, that it threatened their health and their lives. In the decades since that realization came to pass, through the actions of government and the ingenuity of American industry, we have made tremendous strides. In the last 30 years, <coughs> we have reduced air pollution in the United States by nearly a third, even as our economic output has more than doubled. Over the past six years alone, 43 million more Americans breathe air that meets federal standards. Every day, thanks to these efforts, we are preventing, as a society, 600 premature deaths and 2,000 cases of asthma and bronchitis every single day. And I want to say, I'm going to say this 15 times before I sit down, if you have noticed, it hasn't done any harm to the economy. I am very grateful for the opportunity that uh, Vice President Gore and I have had to work with Americans in industry and environmental groups to make our air even cleaner, from taking actions to reduce power plant emissions and clean the air over our national parks, to setting the toughest standards ever for soot and smog. Again, I say, as with all of our other efforts in the environment over the last three decades, America has proven wrong the skeptics who claim that the cost of fighting pollution would be ruinous. In fact, listen to this. Since 1970, the direct benefits of the Clean Air Act, lower health costs and fewer days work loss, for example, have outweighed the cost of the Clean Air Act by more than one trillion dollars. Still, even as our city skylines emerge from the haze and even as millions of Americans are spared from debilitating disease, these hard-won gains could soon be put at risk. Why? A big part of the reason is that we Americans love to drive, and we are driving more than ever. A new car rolling off the assembly line today is 95 percent less polluting than the typical new car was back in 1970. But there are more than twice as many cars on the road today. And the number of miles driven each year has grown even faster. What's more, fully half the new vehicles sold today are sport utility vehicles, minivans, and pickups, which produce three to five times as much pollution as the average passenger car. Driving now accounts for 30 percent of the total air pollution in America. And unless we take additional measures, air quality in many parts of our country will continue to worsen in the coming decades. That is why today I am honored to announce the boldest steps in a generation to clean the air we breathe by improving the cars we drive. Working closely with industry, we will ensure both the freedom of American families to drive the vehicles of their choice and the right of American children to breathe clean, healthy air. First, we're setting tough new standards that over the coming decade will reduce tailpipe emissions as much as 95 percent. Second, for the first time, we are applying the same stringent standards to cars and to sport utility vehicles including the largest models. Thank you. And third, because cleaner fuels also are critical to achieving cleaner air, we're cutting the sulfur content of gasoline by up to 90 percent. These measures will assure every American cleaner air well into the 21st century. It will permit, prevent thousands of premature deaths and protect millions of our children from respiratory disease. It will be the most dramatic improvement in air quality since the catalytic converter was first introduced a quarter century ago. And manufacturers will be able to meet these new standards while still offering the kinds of models popular with consumers today. I want to 
say a special word of appreciation for all those that worked with EPA in developing this new strategy. I thank the auto and the oil industries, the states, the environmental communities, the leading public health experts. The issues were not always easy, to put it mildly. But working together, we have, I am convinced, come to solutions that are best for our nation's health and for our nation's economy. We will continue to work together also, and this is very important, to create cleaner diesel fuel, our next big challenge in this area. <clears throat> and I will do all I can to expand our efforts with the auto industry, which have already borne a lot of fruit, in the same spirit of col collaboration, to provide our consumers with vehicles that are not just less polluting, but also far more fuel efficient. Now, yeah, you can clap for that. Won't be long till you'll be amazed what will be available on the market on that score. It seems impossible to believe, but in just 10 days, we will close out a century of remarkable progress on a high note, and we will begin a new millennium. We will have new opportunities and new challenges. We, all of us, I think, wonder what the future holds for our children as we unravel the mysteries of the human gene and search the outer reaches of black holes in the universe. There's no telling what's just around the turn in the new century. We are very fortunate that we end the century and begin the millennium with really an unprecedented level of economic prosperity and social progress and national self-confidence with the absence of overwhelming internal crisis or external threat. This combination of conditions has not existed before, at least in my lifetime. But I would argue to all of you that because of the good times, we have a peculiar responsibility to think about the big, long-term issues that will frame the lives that we dream for our children. And we have the opportunity to shape the future in a way that perhaps no generation before us has ever had. One of the things that we ought to do first is to make sure as many of our children as possible have a full future. You know, any of us who've ever been in a hospital delivery room know that when a baby comes into the world, the first thing that's done is to make sure the infant can draw its first breath. As we embark on the new millennium, among all of our other responsibilities, surely it is our sacred obligation to ensure that each and every child from the first breath on will be drawing the cleanest, purest, healthiest air we can provide. Today's a big step in the right direction, and I thank all of you who have been involved in it. Thank you very much.